So, tonight's talk is another one of our little controversial fun talks we're going to talk about. And it's about plant medicine. What do you guys think I mean when I say that? Drugs. Not drugs, they're good drugs. Marijuana! Good Not drugs. medicine like that. Good medicine. So it's really interesting. Go ahead, Rita. Well, I, I think about food and also um, marijuana. Right? Marijuana. So, this is not going to be more about herbs and things like that. This is going to be more about the psychedelic realm. Okay, we will talk maybe a little bit about marijuana. But this is going to be about more about spiritual healing and these kind of controversial areas that we've never heard about. That our culture is kind of pretty um, negative on, I guess. Okay? And I just want to give you kind of my experience from the start of this whole thing. I'm going to be very open if you guys want to ask me questions. You're more than welcome to. Don't forget, I got married by a shaman with my wife so I've been around this stuff um, pretty recently. I was first introduced to in high school, not personally, but I had to <laughs> I had to interview a person who had done like any kind of drug, and the drug they assigned me was LSD. So I interviewed this person who was in high school who had done LSD before, and I talked to this person, and I was at, I was like, describe your experience with me. And they were telling me all these things about all the, they saw colors that they've never seen before, and they had this crazy experience, and he took it like in a concert somewhere, and he was having this crazy experience. And then he told me afterwards, I was, I was depressed for an entire year afterwards. And he was, as, a, as like a 17 year old, I was like, whoa, what's that about? And I remember saying, and I remember this, feeling this way. Wow, that's something I will never do. Oh my God, those are hardcore. They're so harmful to the body. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And I feel like that's the way we're kind of presented about these things. Okay? Now at 34, at about 30, I was introduced to a shaman and started to go down a path of being introduced to stuff and seeing him use it in ceremonies. Not LSD, but drugs like this. I don't even like calling them drugs because they're plants, honestly. Okay? LSD is a drug. It's artificially made. Make sense? Yep. But what he was using were plants, and it, as we're going to get into, it's been around for thousands upon thousands of years. And what I've learned is that there are really right ways and right times to do this stuff, and there are some times that you should never, ever do it, and you have to, it's a very serious thing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you don't know what you're doing and you go into this world, you can have a psychosis. What this person was doing was he had no training. Probably like most 16, 17, 18 year olds have no clue what they're doing. Take it recreationally, and they can lead to a really bad depression because it's a really powerful spiritual aid. Make sense? Okay, so let's get into this. There's a really good TED talk called The War on Consciousness by a guy named Graham Hancock. And he's kind of describing the way we're talking about this. When I say something like LSD, we immediately think of drug. And we, we put it into a category of things maybe like heroin or cocaine or things like that, right, right away. And what you start to realize when you get into this world is there's kind of two classifications. There are things that open up your consciousness and your mind, and then there are things that shut it down. There are things that make you into joy and peace and love, and then there are things that create violence and harm. Okay, but we're not taught that, okay? You have to realize, too, and by the way, Graham Hancock is somebody who goes on to talk about how he had an experience with ayahuasca. He was somebody that was a, um, he was an author. He used to smoke a lot of pot. He would smoke it all the time. He thought it made him creative, for example. He does this thing called ayahuasca, which we'll get into, and it takes him on this journey and to say, hey, stop smoking marijuana. Mm -hmm. And guess what he does? For sure. <laughs> he doesn't listen to it. Hmm. Right? Keeps going on his way. All of a sudden, a few years go by, he does a second dose of ayahuasca, and this time, it said it dragged him through hell. Mm. So literally, this female figure, we'll talk about, dragged him through the depths of hell. He was terrified for about eight hours. Mm. And the whole time, it was saying to him, hey, this is what your life will be like if you don't stop this habit. So he was doing it hardcore? He was just doing it every day. It was like part of his ritual. You know, it was... Again, abusing a substance. So he was abusing, not just... But again, he goes on to talking about that, and we can talk about the uses of the stuff. And he even says, I'm not saying don't ever have cannabis. You know, he's just saying for his life and what this thing taught him. And he said when he got done with that, 
He said, I never touch this stuff again. Guess what he found? What happened to his creativity? Went up. Went up. So, you get into this stuff, it's not something you take recreation. Who wants to go to the depths of hell all the time and hang out there? <laughs> no. It's not a recreational thing, you know? When you get into this stuff, it's not something you actually want to do. It's something that you're called into at times. Okay? But there is a war on it. Look, think about guys, what drugs are legal we have in our country today? Alcohol. Alcohol, Alcohol right? What else? Prescription. Tobacco, prescription, prescription drugs. drugs. You know in the state of Florida, painkillers was the number one killer mm -hmm. for the longest time here? Killed more th thing than anybody is painkillers. Mm -hmm. These are the things that are illegal that we don't think about. Did you guys know every single school shooting, what was the kid on? Antidepressants, or was it on them? <laughs> Antidepressants. Yeah. Anti-anxiety drugs. Question. They're dangerous substances, but for some reason, we think these are okay. By the way, how much money do they make on these things? Billions. Billions upon billions of dollars. Okay? How much money can you make on plants? Lots. You could. You can't patent them. Right? There's no patent on a plant. You can't do that. Let's go into this harm scale. We're going to do a little test here. We got some drugs listed up here. There's a scale that they have where they can rank how harmful a substance is. It's out of 100. So if something's a 100 out of 100, it's the most dangerous thing in the world, right? Nothing's a 100 out of 100. So let's go through this list. And this is harm to yourself and harm to others. Okay? I didn't break them up, but you can actually go on and look at it. So of these drugs, cocaine, tobacco, LSD, alcohol, heroin, psilocybin, cannabis. Which one's the most dangerous? Heroin. Who says heroin? Raise your hand. Cocaine. 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 How about tobacco? Tobacco. Yes. LSD. Alcohol. Alcohol. Yeah. alcohol. <laughs> Heroin. Maybe alcohol. Psilocybin. Alcohol. Cannabis. Cannabis. You gotta knock the door down. Alcohol. 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 Cocaine. You just take the door off. And then alcohol <laughs> is by far the most damaging <laughs> of all those drugs. Yeah. Oh. So guys, this is gonna get into our belief systems of what we're taught. Alcohol is legal. How many people here have ever drank before? You guys have had the most hardcore, dangerous substance on the planet. Congratulations. Okay, yeah. Okay, by far, and not only harmful to the self, it harms others more than any drug by far. Second most harmful, heroin. So it brings to 55. And then we drop a ton. Cocaine? 27. Oh, really? Yeah. Tobacco? A line of baking is the doctor. A 26. <laughs> oh, what did Sean say? <laughs> <laughs> I've never actually done cocaine or not. Okay, cannabis. What's cannabis at? Two. 20. And who, who says it's 20? These are done based on lots and lots of studies and tests. Yeah, so this is based on how much it causes harm to yourself and to others. So I'm, ass I'm assuming it's because people will get stoned and drive a car or something like that. You know, things like that. LSD. Where do you think it ranks? 15? Wow. Where's no. psilocybin? Two. I don't even know what that is. Psilocybin is magic mushrooms. Oh. Or like you've heard of mushrooms that... Three. It's like a negative. Why do you guys see this? Six. Well, there's a whole list of them. This is the most. So I took the most out of all. Why are people laughing? I don't know. This is my magic mushroom. Alright, guys. So, guys, let's do this. Which one of these are legal? Which ones are the psychedelics? LSD, psilocybin, psilocybin. Cannabis, I don't think, is considered a psychedelic. Smoking up with it is. So, guys, I want to point this out. Guys, let's keep it up, please, Joey. So, when we talk about this stuff, guys, again, it's in. It was in my brain. This stuff is super dangerous. Stay away from this stuff. Mm. Right? It's not that dangerous as far as harming yourself or others. Now, again, it's pretty serious stuff. I'm not saying go out and take LSD. That's not what this talks about. Right? <laughs> but I want you guys to realize as far as causing harm, we've been kind of brainwashed. There's a war on consciousness. Which of these drugs actually create harm? Which of these ones actually promote? Peace and love. Remember the whole hippie revolution, right? 
What was it all about? Back in the day, LSD was not illegal. It was psilocybin. What? People took it, and guess what happened? What did people want? Peace. 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 What was going on at the time the in the 60s? The war. Vietnam. Vietnam. Wow, so what started to happen, when we had, which we had a draft? Did people really want to be drafted in the war after no. taking this stuff? No. no. Did people start to see? You see, what this stuff does is it <clears throat> blurs the borders between us. And you start to see, wow, the person in front of me is me too. I love this person. So imagine being in that state and then saying, wow, I want to go to war. You come back out of your trip, you don't want to go to war. Right? That's a big part of this whole thing, okay? So Graham Hancock, if you guys want to look at it, it's a TED Talk that, guess what? It was banned. So the TED Talk was banned. And him talking about his experience with this stuff and why we start to ban this stuff and what the war is up. Why do they make some of these things legal and some of these illegal? Money. Right? Just, I just want you guys to ask that question. How come alcohol is legal and LSD or psilocybin is illegal? Psilocybin is what you find in mushrooms, wild mushrooms. So I want you guys to think about this. The government is saying, hey, a mushroom that you find and put in your mouth is illegal, and it's a Schedule One drug, mm -hmm. saying it's massively addictive, you get into a lot of trouble if you found with these things, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's only a 6 out of 100 on the harm right. scale. There's got to be a reason for it. They want to use this for their medicine. No, they don't want you to have that power, that potential. So, just uh, something to think about. But let's talk about the history of psychedelics. Okay. Because they're mind-expanding drugs. Yes. They start to open your consciousness. You start to yeah. see they don't want that. the world. They expand your mind. Mm -hmm. They make you connect with your neighbors. Right. That's what they've always been used for for thousands upon mm -hmm. thousands of years. And in a rat race, that doesn't work. No. So let's talk about this. When was the history of psychedelics? When was the first psychedelic taken or, or recorded history? In the cave. Yeah, so cave drawings yeah. in every culture around the world has mushrooms and psychedelics all about it. Every culture we've ever known of, every ancient culture has had psychedelics as a part of it. Mm -hmm. So, his name and culture is in ancient India. We had a drink called Soma and in Thailand. They had mushrooms in Siberia, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, in Ireland, and in the Americas, both north and south, for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. Nobody knows when it started. It goes back as far as our history goes back. Okay? There's one guy, anyone heard of a man named Terrence McKenna? Yeah. yeah. So, Mick, I don't know his last name. Terence McKenna. He came out with a theory called the Stoned Ape Theory. And what he said was this: Did you guys know about? Well, and again, you guys are kind of, who here is my flat Earth talk, and the Earth is only five thousand years old. <laughs> who knows any of this stuff? How true it is? How untrue it is? But supposedly, about two hundred thousand years ago, there was a massive development overnight of our brain. We went from Homo erectus to Homo sapien like that. And our brain doubled in size, and no one knows how it happened. You might hear some people say, oh, it's because we ate meat. But it's kind of a ridiculous argument. Some people said it's because we started cooking food, and we cooked starches, which have a lot more sugar. And once you cook a starch, there's a lot more energy. Terrence McKenna had the stone eat theory. Not saying it's true, but what he said was this, was where we came from were the forests of Africa, and then eventually we got pushed out into the plains of Africa. And what was there was these giant animals that produced a lot of dung. And what do mushrooms grow out of? Dung. So what we started to do is look for food. We're used to the forest and fruit trees, and we started to go out into the plains, and we'd have this, these mushrooms, these fungi, and we would take them, and we would eat them, and we would essentially go into this psychedelic space. And we would do this over and over, and just, just like that, our consciousness quantum leaped because of what it taught us. It taught us how to cook food, it taught us how to, to live. And the other thing was, if you look at ape societies, they're very male-dominated societies. They have a harem, one male with lots of females, for example, and they have alpha males. What he started saying was, because of this, when you're on these, these substances, they, like I said, they get rid of the borders between who we are. And instead of seeing things as separate, you start to see everything collectively as a group. 
And it, according to him, it got rid of the male-dominated society. It created more of an equality. So it started to be more of a group collective consciousness as opposed to having your like one tribe with one male all the time. Does that make sense? Pretty interesting stuff. And then eventually the, uh, Africa started to dry up and it became desert land and people had to move into different parts of the world without this stuff. But that's his. There's actually a link to Christmas and mushrooms. <laughs> you guys know that. You guys know the, the toadstool mushroom? It's yes. like the one that's really famous. It's white with the red. Yeah. They're yes. saying that's where it comes from. It's actually grown in Siberia. Mm -hmm. And the Siberian shamans, the medicine people there, in December, they would go and they would deliver these mushrooms <laughs> to their, their neighbors and all the people in their tribe. And a lot of times the snow was so high they couldn't get in the front door, so guess what they had to do? Go down the chimney. They had to go down the chimney. Hey, guess what the shaman's Merry Christmas. Guess what the shaman's spirit animal was? Damn. It's not a reindeer. A reindeer. A reindeer. Just kidding. <laughs> Pretty crazy, right? There's even some people who believe that. It's actually manna in the Bible. Manna's never really talked about what it actually is. So if you read Exodus, the story of Exodus is when Moses is leading people across the desert, right? So I want to read you guys a little excerpt from it. Let's do it. So this is after God promised manna from the sky, or God is going to give the bread of life to these people. It says, When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. So first of all, what he's saying is, it only happened, by the way, they would wake up in the morning when the dew was there, and there would be this white disc-like frost everywhere. If anyone knows anything about mushrooms, that's how they appear. They appear in the morning, and then what happens is they sit out in the sun, they get destroyed, and what ends up happening is they turn to kind of slush. So then it goes on to say, Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning, meaning pluck what you got right now and, and, and eat it and save it. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. So some people say, wow, the, at least these are mushrooms that he was talking about. That's what manna is. And some people believe it was psychedelic mushrooms, as Moses would obviously take some, and then have conversations with God. Okay? It's interesting, they call, they call in the manna the bread of God. And in other cultures, for example, in Aztec culture, what they call mushrooms is the flesh of God. Okay? And obviously as Christians, you might know that what's the bread of God symbolize? The flesh. Right? So it's pretty interesting, the connections that are there. So let's talk about some of these psychedelics and what we're talking about. The first one is something called LSA. Anyone heard of LSA before? So this is the natural form of something that we call LSD. Okay, this was made in a laboratory, but it's based off of this stuff that's found in nature. Okay, anyone know what plants this is found in? There's a couple. Anyone heard of a morning glory? morning glory. So morning glory. Those flowers, they produce these seeds. And you take about 40 of these seeds. It's a lot of seeds to take. And they have these little bits of these, this thing called LSA in it. So when you take it, you start to have something like an LSD or like an acid trip while you take it. Psilocybin, where's that from? What plants have this in it? Mushrooms. Mushrooms. Now, not all mushrooms have it. You know what the most dangerous part about mushrooms are? It's the lowest drug of anything on this scale. The most dangerous thing is actually just picking the wrong mushroom and eating those and actually getting sick or dying from the mushroom. Not from an actual psilocybin mushroom. Okay? Other names for it? Mushrooms. Magic yeah. mushrooms. And I want to write this on there. In shaman culture, especially in the Americas, they call this the children. Okay? We'll talk about that. Mescaline. What's mescaline from? Total mescaline, peyote. Right? Peyote. Where's peyote big? Or San Pedro. Isn't it big in... Um, Reservation? Yeah, like, uh, yeah, like, like yeah. Arizona or something. San Pedro. Yeah. yeah, these are the Americas, right? Mm -hmm. So these are more of North American culture, taking peyote and communing with God. 
And what these are called, this is called grandfather. Huh. And then the last one, DMT. Have you heard of DMT before? There's a documentary on, um, yeah. on Netflix called The Spirit Molecule. So every single animal and substance, any living thing on the planet, has receptors in f for this thing called DMT. We can all make DMT. And the reason they call it the spirit molecule is that w when somebody or something dies, right before they die, they release DMT. Wow. So most of us mm -hmm. have never released DMT into our system. Most people never release it until right before they die and they release it. So you know why people say that? So if anyone's been around people who have passed away, right before they passed away, they, they start seeing things yeah. or talking to people. Yep. They call it the spirit molecule because molecule, they believe it actually starts to connect you to another <laughs> realm. They see their ancestors. Okay? Yeah. So it's pretty interesting stuff. Anyone know where we get this stuff? It's in ayahuasca. ayahuasca. Anyone heard of ayahuasca before? But ayahuasca is not a plant. It's a combination of plants. The ayahuasca vine is a plant, and then they have to do well, something else. So we'll talk about yeah. this, okay? And by the way, an AKA for this, grandmother. Okay? There's a reason why. I want you guys to realize these things have been around for thousands of years, okay? Really interesting stories behind these, especially ayahuasca. Let's get into that real quick. The reason they call it grandmother is because when people take this stuff, a lot of times they see a female spirit mm -hmm. when they're on it. And they, they, it's called Grandmother Ayahuasca. And she'll take people on, really love it, kind of, she's a healer. So people go to her for healing. For thousands of years people have been doing this. To listen to her, they'll ta she'll take her through this, this journey with them. So a lot of people report seeing that. Versus peyote, it's more of a masculine spirit that most people see as they go through it, okay? And then the mushrooms are the children. They're kind of the light ones. So in our culture, mushrooms are kind of what we're used to, right? Mm -hmm. The reason for it is usually a lighter ceremony. In fact, a lot of people abuse it. Where do people take mushrooms? People take it at concerts and things like that. They can use these recreationally and get away with it, can't they? Because it's light. It's, it's, it's more fun in a way. Versus when you hear stories of ayahuasca or something like that, it's something that you would never abuse in your life because you go to some really dark place. You go for spiritual healing. You go to learn what's going on inside of you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, talking about ayahuasca, just to show you kind of the spiritual side of this thing, I want you guys to realize something. DMT is something that we can't just eat. So there's an ayahuasca vine that has this stuff called DMT in it. But if we eat it, there's these, things, these enzymes in our stomach that break it down right away. So you can eat all of it you want, you won't feel anything. But we have this, there's this other plant in South America that inhibits the enzymes, that stop the enzymes from working. It's called, called an MAO inhibitor. So how many plants are there in the Amazon? Something like 10,000 different. And what these Amazon, these Amazon tribes actually believe, these shamans say, is that the plants speak to them and tell them. I want you to think about this. They knew to take this ayahuasca plant, this is without science, mm -hmm. and this other random plant and mix them together. Hmm. And by doing that, the one plant inhibits the enzyme so the DMT will go into your system. How does that happen? You guys know how many combinations they have to try in order for that to happen? It's, it's mm -hmm. endless. But this, the plants spoke to them. That's how connected to nature they are. So what they do is they put these two plants together and they brew this stew. And then the shaman will give it to whoever's taking it. And you'll usually do it at nighttime and you'll sip this, this uh, stew. And then you have the next four, six, eight hours with the shaman. And they're watching you and you literally go on a journey. Okay, we'll talk about what it's like later. But I just want you guys to realize how amazing is that? That alone. What's the other plant? I don't know the name of it. Oh. No. Can't tell you guys, because then you guys go home and make this stuff. I'm just saying, do you have any seeds? <laughs> <laughs> What's the name? What's the name? What's the name? What's really interesting, though, other animals don't have the enzymes in their stomach, so they can actually eat the vine and actually just have the same thing. And animals do that all the time in the Amazon. 
I actually watched a little video of a leopard actually eating the DMT, eating the ayahuasca vine, and then literally laying on its back and just looking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but what what the what the tribesmen there say is that the animals will take it to learn from the plant how to hunt more efficiently and how to be a better uh, animal. It's a pretty neat thing. Do you have a question, Joy? No, not yet. <laughs> He's saving them all up. I am Give definitely saving this one. Yeah. So, <laughs> by the way, so LSA. Oh, by the way, besides Morning Glory, there's something called Hawaiian. <coughs> Baby Wood Rose plant. So, these are seeds. You take those seeds. You usually chew the seeds, or you, you can make a, a, a stew out of them, or something like that. And you'll have what's called like an LSD-like state. It actually opens your heart up. You actually go very inward with this. This is not hallucinogenic like LSD is. So it actually is a, you go inside your body, you really feel a lot of stuff. Psilocybin, mushrooms, very psychedelic, lots of colors, lots of brightness. Um, mescaline, again, this is grandfather. This is actually very heart space as well. So peyote opens your heart up to love more, gets you really in your body. DMT is more of a spiritual journey in your head. Close your eyes, lots of visions, things like that. They also call this the vine of the dead. If that makes you feel any excitement towards it. <laughs> because a lot of times when you take this stuff, you actually are brought to your death. You feel yourself die and then come back alive. So it's a pretty intense moment there, right? Mm -hmm. So you only do this stuff if you're called for it, which we'll talk about, okay? Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, you can rank this stuff as far as psychedelic experiences. Again, Terrence McKenna, he's got a lot of audio on YouTube you guys can listen to if you're interested in it. But pretty much this way, the most out of all of these things are DMT. You can also, there are people who take what's called straight DMT where you smoke it, it's like a 15 minute journey, and these yeah. people report that literally 15 minutes sometimes can feel like a thousand years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's things that we can't mm -hmm. even comprehend, so some people take this stuff, and again, you know, to each his own, uh, you know, it's, it sounds terrifying to me, but <laughs> people will take this stuff, and what'll happen is they'll say they'll go to this place where they feel like they've been forever, it feels like home. It feels like they have been there more than they've not been there. And it feels like it's the place where your soul gets reborn over and over again. And they say it feels so much like home, but they'll swear a thousand years go by. And they come back and it's been 15 minutes. I mean, what? Pretty, pretty intense experiences, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so I've never done straight DMT, you, no. It's not the next you one. Ring. What's that? Like no, it's like, like, like 15 minutes. Yeah, it is. Sure. Next time can be affected. Your perception. All right, guys. I got a surprise for everybody. We're going to do it all now. Okay. So, out of yeah, this, you know, Pass the basket. By the way, this stuff is all illegal, by the way. So, And I hope you guys realize that, too. This stuff is made for, like, shaman. And we're going to talk about this. This stuff is something we don't take light. You never, ever, ever do this stuff alone. Okay? But you can rank this stuff on how much of a psychedelic or spiritual experience you will have with this stuff. Mm -hmm. So something like cannabis, on a scale of 1 to 5, if you smoke marijuana, it, most people get to a 1. If you smoke a lot of marijuana, it'll get you to about a 2. Mm -hmm. Okay? DMT, straight DMT, is about a 5, whereas ayahuasca is about a 4. Okay? Same with mescaline. Or mescaline is usually about a 3. LSA is about a three to four, depending on how much you take. Psilocybin is the only one. You can, it depends on how much you take. One all the way to five. Whoa. So if you take a little bit of a mushroom, you'll just feel, honestly, some people do this, they feel like they smoked a little bit of pot. If you take more, you get to more of these phases, you can take this and have pretty much a straight thing where all the borders fade away, and it's just you. It's a pretty intense experience. I've never done that, so I'm just saying. It's a pretty intense experience. Okay, that make sense? You guys can ask me questions. I'll be open with you guys, too. So, famous users of this stuff. You guys heard of Tim Leary before? Mm -hmm. Okay, you have a question, Sean? Uh, <laughs> Is that why when, like, people that do do it, they combine cannabis with other ones to try to elevate, like, the intensity of it? 
So there are people who are called like psychonauts, like Terrence McKenna. And again, if you guys know anything about archetypes, we'll talk about you know it's kind of like what your archetypes are. Terrence McKenna would do something crazy, like he would take something like uh, acid, and in the middle of his trip, he would take like a hit of DMT. Oh my God. I mean, it's like, but there are people who are built for this stuff. It's like what he was meant to do here. If you read his stuff, I mean, he was, they called him a psychonaut because it's like an astronaut for the mind. That's you know? awesome. And it leads me perfectly into this. Tim Leary, sure. anyone know who Tim Leary was? Yeah. yeah. So Tim Leary is a psychologist at Harvard, and he had a buddy <laughs> named Richard Alpert. Anyone know who Richard Alpert is? Yes. yes. Is that Ram Dass? Ram Dass. Yeah. So these guys were professors at Harvard in the psychology department. And Ram Dass will tell his experience of, so I'm sitting there, and I'm with the best minds ever, right? We're Harvard professors in psychology, and I'm asking all my, my colleagues these questions, and no one knows the answer. He's like, and I realized real quick that none of us knew anything about the mind. Smartest people about the mind know nothing about the mind. He calls up his friend Tim Leary, who spent a couple of years in Mexico, and these Mexicans down there actually introduced him to these mushrooms. And Tim Leary called, it's, it's, it's talking to him, and he says, Hey, Richard, he's like, you'll never believe this. I learned more in five hours on this mushroom than I learned in all of my years studying psychology. <laughs> like, I learned way more about the mind in five hours. So they start doing these experiments at Harvard with um, psilocybin, with mushrooms, and with LSD. And they had some pretty ridiculous results with it. So, one thing they did was something called the Concord Prisoner Experiment. <laughs> what they did was they actually took prisoners and they would give them either LSD or they'd give them mushrooms and they would actually do psychotherapy with them while they were doing it. Most prisoners have about a 60% relapse rate, meaning when they get out, 60% of them will have another crime like, just like their other one. It dropped all the way to 20% by doing this stuff, right? So they were all for this. The problem with it was... Um, <laughs> So Tim Leary started to get pretty, with like pretty much telling all of his undergrad students to start taking it. Harvard didn't like it, so they got kicked out. Tim Leary kind of went off in his own path, and then Richard Alpert ended up becoming Ram Dass at some point. We'll talk about that journey too. Okay. Some other famous people, famous users: Steve Jobs. You guys know that. Steve Jobs did not smoke marijuana because he said it closed in his consciousness. But he was very open to taking things like LSD or LSA and psilocybin because he thought it opened his mind up and he saw the world completely different. How this stuff works, guys, is it connects parts of your brain that have never been connected before. So when you take this stuff, you start to see the world from a different angle and you're like, wow, how come I never thought of that before? How come I never saw that before? Okay? Cary Grant, the actor, um, Joe Rogan, if you guys know him, he's got a famous podcast now. George Carlin, you guys know George Carlin? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What was his, what was his uh, comedy usually about? Well, it's usually about politics a lot, too, and how we saw the world and all the kind of, you know, what the, what the government has us going into and all the wars and all this stuff, right? He was very against it. Bill Gates, Jack Nicholson, the list goes on and on and on. You guys know Tim Ferriss? Yeah. Yeah, he wrote the book, The 4-Hour Work Week, 4-Hour Body. So what this guy does is he hangs out with a lot of really famous people. And what he says is if you hang out at any billionaire party, it's kind of the code, like everyone who is a billionaire who hangs out at these parties, they all do these psychedelics. It's kind of the mainstream thing, but no one talks about it. You know. So a lot of famous people have taken this stuff because they see the world so differently. And there's been a lot of breakthroughs while people are on this stuff as well. Have you, um, there's something called um, reverse transcriptase. What they do is they take little pieces of DNA. And they can take that little piece of DNA and multiply it and make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And why that's important is they can find like an old fossil of something with a little bit of its DNA. And now they can replicate it and make it bigger and bigger so they can actually study it. The guy who invented that won a Nobel Peace Prize. But the guy couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. And then one day he took an acid trip or an LSD trip, and it just came to him like that. And that's how he figured out how to do this mind-blowing experiment that people are using today. What is that? Can you like, repeat like, who it was? I don't know his name. You can look it up. It's the guy who created, um, it's called reverse transcriptase, I believe, or the thing that, yeah, go ahead, Sean. Um, is, do you know if there's actually like proof that the two guys that created the actual structure of DNA would, did they actually take LSD when they were doing that? Like Watson and Crick? Yeah, thank you. I don't know if they did. Okay. Maybe mix in the story with this guy. Okay. Who like you can amplify DNA. 
It was what? a really big exp- thing. Watson I think it was and Crick. What? Watson and Crick. No, that's what Sean's saying, but I don't think I think they might be mistaken with this guy who created this. He won a Nobel Peace Prize for his advancements in being able to amplify DNA. That's okay. the Watson and Crick guy. No. 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 Oh no, that's the other. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So what a trip is like. It depends on what substance you're taking. Now I'll just be honest with you guys. I've taken ayahuasca a couple times. Okay. I can tell you it's not something that's fun to do, but it's something that calls you. Just to give you like a brief history, I was an athlete in high school. Like I didn't even drink in high school. I was very kind of like a straight edge person. Um, and then, and again, I was freaked out by my story right there. I'm like, I'm never doing any of this stuff. And then I would say about like when I was 25, for some reason I heard about this thing called ayahuasca one time. And I was so drawn to it. It was like something in my mind was like, wow, I feel like I need to experience it at some point in my life. And then I got a little bit older, and the, the calling got more and more and more. And it literally felt like I was being called to it. Does that make sense? And then all of a sudden, boom, here's this shaman who does it right down the road for me. And I have this experience to have this experience. I got this opportunity to experience this. So my first ceremony, you sit around a circle in this fire. There's a fire in the middle. It starts at nighttime. And it's the craziest. There's probably about 30 people in, in the group I was in. And you sit around, and, you know, the shaman's there. He, he, before you do it, the shaman talks to every single person beforehand and makes sure that you can handle it and that he feels like you're okay and that you're safe to take this stuff, right? If you're on certain medications, no way. If you're in a certain health condition, no way. Okay. And then what happens is they, they brew the tea beforehand. He goes around the circle. He calls everybody to him, and you sip this stuff, and you drink this, and you drink this. So you go around the circle. From the first person... All the way to me, I was one of the last people. It took about 45 minutes for everyone to get their little cup and drink it, right? And while people were drinking it, they'd go back to their space. They would just sit down. And everyone's got a little sleeping bag or a chair to hang out in. And then all of a sudden, the last person takes it. And then all of a sudden, dead quiet, middle of the night, fire's going. And then they start playing music. Start hitting a drum. And starts or whistling. Start singing. And just like that, it's like boom, you get turned into this ceremony. You're totally fine, and just like that, you start to see stuff. The sound is what activates. The shaman literally works with it and starts speaking into it, and you start to see certain things. Um, for me, I was the last one. I was the first one to get up, and I actually started to vomit. Because a lot of this stuff, when you get into like an ayahuasca ceremony, you start to purge. You purge, you purge, you purge. So you vomit, you vomit, you vomit not uncommon for ayahuasca peyote a little bit that's not true with mushrooms or with this stuff okay with ayahuasca you purge and then depending on the person you go to different places for me literally it was 10 minutes of pure terror i can't even (laughs) describe it you go to i went to this place that was so terrifying i just i can't even describe it you're like oh my god i can't believe i did this is this going to be the next like four hours of my life? Get me out of here. And then you surrender. And then all of a sudden you just feel like, whew, let me just surrender. Or for me, I put my hands in the grass. I could feel the grass. And then all of a sudden, just like that, I could start to connect with the earth better than I've ever connected. And then you start to feel such euphoria. It's unbelievable. You feel this connection with all living things. You see the earth and you're like, wow. How complicated do we make life? It's so simple. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And you have this mo- these moments of clarity of like, wow, life's so easy. I mean, God gave us all this beautiful land, all these beautiful trees, all this food, this fruit that we can be eating, and we make it so complicated. You know, and you start to get into this, this, and again, this is just my experience. But just to let you know, some people, like for example, some of the medical uses of this stuff is for depression, and it's really big today in our country for addiction. So people, just like, remember Graham Hancock took it, he, had, he didn't even know he had an addiction, that he was abusing marijuana. People with heroin will go and they'll take this stuff and literally they'll look down and their veins will be popping out of them, screaming at them. And they'll feel, you know what it's like when you see somebody who's a heroin addict from, like, from your perspective and what they look like? They'll come out of body and they'll see themselves. And their, their hair, the veins will be yelling at them, saying, look what you're doing to me. And they'll feel it, and they'll feel all this agony. And they'll come out of it, and guess what? Never touch this stuff again. 
That's how powerful this stuff is, right? So, this is a, these are the main things that a lot of this stuff is used for. But like I said, it's been used to curb vi violent behavior before. Um, I've had people do this, tell me stories they've done, for example, ayahuasca. And they had a memory of when they were four years old and they were sexually abused by someone in their family and had no clue. Like, things will pop up from their past they had no clue about and they get to heal from that as well. They'll get intuitions about their health conditions. So you'll have people with cancer, for example, they'll do it and they'll get a sign. Um, what's really interesting about this stuff, too, Terrence McKenna talks about this a lot, is you can actually go into this stuff with an intention or a prayer, and that's actually what the shaman will have you do. So you'll go in, like let's say you're taking ayahuasca, and let's say you, you have cancer. You can go in and say, okay, grandmother ayahuasca, please show me how I can heal myself. And then you'll be on this trip, and you'll get your answers just like that. It's pretty amazing stuff, right? So, it's a very interesting experience. It's not for the faint of heart. Here's the bad side of doing this stuff. Most important is something called psychosis. Okay? Guys, this stuff works by taking your mind and all your beliefs and just going, blowing them up. You know, the stuff you see when you're on it, like I said, sometimes you're not ready to see the stuff. So if you take this stuff and you're not called to do it, some really bad things can happen. You can come back and you can have, wow, where was my mind? Like, everything I thought was true is not true. I see the world from a completely different way now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, it leads to what's called the dark nights of the soul. Meaning some really, when you come, you might feel like you're in a really good spot when you're in this stuff. But afterwards, you're really depressed. Remember my friend, the guy I interviewed, he said I was depressed for a whole year. I understand it now. He was somebody who was 16, 17 at the time, had no spiritual understanding, had no concept of what God is. Not that I do, but you understand, like there's at least some kind of foundation or a source for me to go to. And I have books that I've read, people who've experienced this stuff, so I at least have understanding of what is going on. This poor kid, 16 or 17, went into this space, had no clue. He came back and it was like, whoa, super dark for him. Like, what just happened to me? His mind just literally shattered, and he had no one to go to to talk about it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. You can have what's called a bad trip. So a lot of times, and again, when you hear a lot of the negatives of this stuff, you talk about people who took something, and they had a bad trip, meaning they went to a really dark space. Right? It's not a bad trip. It's actually what you need in that moment. So you go into a dark space, you're not supposed to just be like, oh, I'm okay, like, and, and try to avoid it. The trick is to go into it and say, God, what do you want me to learn right now? Why am I going into this really dark space right now? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, guys, just to let you know, I'll, I'll share something really personal with you guys. About a year ago, I actually did an ayahuasca ceremony. It called me, and on it, literally, it told me that Brooke and I were going to separate at one point. It was like, you need to start separating. And I was like, no way, I wouldn't go into it. It was too dark for me. Just to feel that pain or losing somebody that I love so much, it was like, no way am I ever going to do that. No way am I going to go into that. And I wouldn't even go into it. And here I am a year later. It was like this inner truth that I knew was going to happen. Does that make sense? That's how powerful this stuff is. It's pretty wild when you get into it. Okay, It really talks to you. So, you might see some stuff that's not so fun when you're in it. But you just have to, you know, if you're being called for it, it's what's for you at that moment. And then again, when you're in this ceremony, sometimes you vomit, you feel sick. It's all part of the ceremony. Does it sound fun to anybody? Everyone excited about this stuff? Okay. See, you guys thought I was going to be thinking about it. Take hallucinogenics, and now it's like, well, I don't want to do that ever. So this is what I recommend, when to take it and when to use it. Number one, take it seriously. These are not things for recreational use. right? This is not something you take every week, every month. The way a lot of the... Um, Shamans would use it is they would have people use it every season and you kind of check in with it So you would take let's say an ayahuasca ceremony. You would take it and then you would wait And in those three months you would use your lessons that you learned and you would keep using and growing with it And then in three more months you would take another one You would see how you did and what you learned in those three months. Does that make sense? By the way in Peru and things like that ayahuasca is actually introduced to even kids what they do is even when they're born, a mother would take the ayahuasca brew and put it on her nipple and actually give a little bit to a baby as well. 
So they're introduced to it at a very, very young age. It's part of their culture. It's just not part of all c our culture, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I would recommend only, only, only do this with a shaman, with somebody who's trained in this stuff. Okay? There's a couple other outlets for, for this stuff as well. There's a church called Santo Dami Church. Anyone ever heard of that before? So it was actually a Brazilian rubber plant <coughs> farmer who was in Peru, and he was given ayahuasca. This is back, I think, in the early 1900s. And he was a Christian, and he saw Grandmother Ayahuasca, and she told him, hey, you need to go into the rainforest by yourself. You need to drink this every day for seven days, and you need to fast those seven days. So this guy went to the middle of the rainforest by himself, drank ayahuasca every day for seven days, and he came out, he started this church called the Santo Dami Church. It's actually a Christian church. So what they do is they get together, and these are actually legal in the United States. I think there's one in Pompano. Um, I've never been to one, but you know, and I, don't, I can't give a recommendation for or against it. But what they do is you go and you drink ayahuasca, and they sing like church hymns as you go, and you kind of worship Jesus as you go into this ayahuasca trip. So it's interesting, all the different cultures and layers to this stuff as well, okay? So if anyone wants to go to that, let us know how it is. Know, okay? Make sure you only do it if it calls you to. What I mean is just, I think you guys understand what I'm saying. Is like I was never a drug user or anything like that, and for some reason this Nambashi stuck out to me. I was like, wow, for some reason I feel like I need to do that. By the way, this thing is on a rise. Like a lot of shamans have been taught they need to do this. Um, shamans around the world right now are saying there's a sickness in the West, pretty much us. And the sickness is we are disconnected from spirit, and we're destroying our Mother Earth, and that if we don't wake up soon, there's going to be a big problem with us and the rest of the world. So a lot of these shamans started traveling, and people are getting, you know, just like I had a call in, a lot of people are having a calling, especially for more of the female medicine, the ayahuasca. So there's a lot more of this popping up. Again, it is illegal. Um, I don't know the legality as far as if you're a part of like a Native American tribe, because some of their, their medicines are protected. But again, there are a lot of people being called and taking this stuff and really waking up to, wow, when you're on it, you feel so connected to Earth. It's unbelievable. It's like you just really realize what we're forgetting again, okay? But again, I want you guys to realize it's called the above, down, inside, out philosophy. This is what pure life is based on. Where does healing come from? Inside. Inside of you. Does it come from a plant? No. No. <coughs> now, it's interesting that we have receptors for all of these plants inside of us, right? Right. It's almost like God created these things for us to interact with. Make sense? However, I want to tell you guys a story. Maybe you know Ram Dass? Mm -hmm. He moved away from psychedelics. Well, Tim Leary didn't. The reason he did was he went down a spiritual path and he had a guru, an Indian guru. Okay? And there was a story that the guru was interested in this LSD and he gave him LSD, his guru, LSD to try. He gave him six hits of acid. Which is the guy took all of it and the story goes, it brought the guy down in consciousness not up in consciousness. That's how elevated this guy was. That's what meditation does to the brain as well. So just because, guys, remember, we make this stuff inside of us, right? There are breathing techniques that people do that you can actually breathe and produce this stuff inside of you. So you don't just need a plant from the outside, and that's not what I'm saying either. It's not about getting your fix, but you know these people who are like, for example, saints, what do saints do all day? They pray, they meditate on God, and where do you think they're going when they're doing this? What kind of hormones are they releasing compared to us? They're literally communicating with God inside of their body through this stuff. So we have the power within us, and that's the whole point of this stuff, too. Is for you to understand, like, okay, you might be called for one of, one of these things, and you might get a message from something, or you might feel what it feels like to be in that state, but the goal is not to just have to rely on this stuff over and over and over. Okay? The stuff is to go within and do the work and keep connecting. Get your nervous system clear and connect, connect, connect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Did you guys enjoy this tonight? Yeah. yeah. Do you guys have any questions? What are the breathing techniques? 
<laughs> you can look them up online. I forgot the name of them. You can look them up online, though. There's a whole bunch of people who, like, that you can talk about releasing the DMT through breathing techniques. But it's a lot of, like, fire breath stuff. Like, when you breathe in and out real fast, over and over and over like again. Oh, shit. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Transcendental meditation? No, lie, I feel like we've been there before, like, tripping in the middle of meditation. When Brooke was here one time, I remember, like, getting so into it. She was, like, breathing Fast. Right. Like everybody was down. reading like, yep. like for like five yeah. ten minutes, yeah. straight, and we were all like right. out of it completely. Right. I felt more connected, like in that kind of meditation than like even like a calm. One. Right. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, uh, don't we have uh, similar type of um, experiences uh, during sleep and uh, dreaming when dreaming? Yeah. And if you remember the dreams. So you're saying you, you have that experience when you're dreaming? Uh, yeah, I mean something something like that connecting to something bigger. So it's really interesting that uh, Rita's saying that too, is because a lot of the times when you start to go into this world, you start to realize that this is a dream too. Mm -hmm. And that's what people aren't ready for, because it's like, well, if this is your reality, you're not ready to go to the next step and really start to see mm -hmm. it's just a dream. It's all a hologram. Right? My body is not real, it's just energy that we're putting a picture to. And it starts to really start to expand your mind. Just like in a dream, you know in a dream that you can actually start to like levitate and do all this crazy stuff? Like yeah. People will say like, that's the whole point of this realm too, is to get to that point. I mean, what did Jesus do? Walking on water, getting the sick, mm -hmm. just putting his hand on people, getting bread and fish out of thin air. Like it was a dream, just like, oh, boom, there it is. When you see the world for a dream, that's when you have miracles. Go ahead, Joey. So, honestly, I don't know what I want to ask it, so never mind. I've got too intense of a question. Any other questions, guys? Hey, by the way, do you want to make an announcement? Thursday night, we have Shayna Mason, who's doing a talk, our next Pure Lifer talk. Shay, do you want to give a quick little... Consider yeah. what you're going to be talking about. So it's going to be on empathy and oneness, and it actually goes into what Kevin was talking about, how there's um, actually an illusion between our individuals. It goes more into how we're actually connected and the oneness that connects us all. So that's the free talk on Thursday, and then the next Sunday, October 7th, I'm doing a workshop called Empowering Empaths, mm -hmm. and it goes into how to deal with your sensitivity and how to connect to other people on a deeper level. And then in two more weeks, we're going to have Laura doing a talk. Again, guys, I really like this Pure Life on Thursday nights every other Thursday. I think it's going to be really fun. And it doesn't have to be anything like super scientific either. If you guys just want to come up on a Thursday night and share your heart with everybody about what you're going through or whatever it is, I would love to have that, okay? So we do have a spot open for Thursday night and the end of October. So if you guys ever want to do like a little talk here or something like that, please let us know. We'd love to have you guys, okay? Awesome. Love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.